Amen. I want to introduce our guest speaker. He's been here before, uh, Dr. Tim Mackey. He's a good friend of mine. I met Tim. I served 17 years at Blackhawk Church in Madison, and Tim moved from Portland. He grew up here, came to Christ at Skate Church, went to Multnomah, and then went all the way out to, to Madison. They have a renowned program, a PhD in Hebrew and Jewish studies. And so while he was there, I met he and his, his wife, Jessica. Tim is a gifted communicator, as you're about to see. And uh, we realized that at Blackhawk, hired him to be our teaching pastor. So I was on the same staff with him for a number of years. They followed God's call back to Portland, which is awesome. And Tim launched uh, what's called the Bible Project. You'll get to see one of their videos this morning. It's amazing, and they're doing phenomenal work. He's the creative force behind that. And uh, when we're coming to our third message in the Sermon on the Mount, it's on Jesus and the Torah. And I was like, who better to speak all this than Tim Mackey? And I think you'll see that it was a wise uh, decision. So it's our goal to bring Tim back numerous times throughout the year. So be nice to him. Laugh at all of his jokes. Even if they're not funny, just be like, oh, oh that's hilarious. You know, that kind of deal. So buttering him up type of thing. Tim and I uh, go on a backpacking trip every year called Boys in the Wild. So Tim knows a lot about me. He has a lot of stories but what's done in the wild stays in the wild. So he's not going to tell you anything. So give a warm New Hope welcome to Dr. Tim Mackey. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Hey, everybody. How are you guys? Me too. I'm doing good too. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, all right. You guys, uh, we got ground to cover. You... <laughs> Your pastoral leaders have decided to subject you to the Sermon on the Mount this winter. And um, I, I think that's a really good idea for uh, every church community uh, to camp out in uh, these words of Jesus and to work through them. Uh, it's, it's both a privilege and it's also one of the most disturbing things you can do as a human being. Um, because Jesus, he just doesn't pull any punches uh, in this collection of his, his most famous teachings. Um, if you, you know, wherever you're at with Jesus, if you've been following him for a long time, if you're new to the whole Christianity thing, um, or if you're not even quite on board yet, it doesn't matter. This is really important. If, if you want to understand who Jesus was and is and what it means to be one of his followers, you, you can't go anywhere else except to start right here, this collection of his most famous teachings called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's one of these things, his most famous teachings are in here, you guys, the golden rule, uh, love your enemy type of thing, the Lord's Prayer is in here. Um, it's very familiar to at least some of us. And that's actually the danger inherent in the Sermon on the Mount is because these teachings of Jesus can become so familiar that they uh, lose their, their, their power, not because of the words being deficient, but because we grow insensitive to the shock that they actually uh, deliver. Um, there was uh, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi who wrote a short book on this rabbi, Jesus, Rabbi Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and in the introduction, he has this classic line where he says, essentially, the history of Christianity is a history of Christians trying to evade the Sermon on the Mount and avoid living according to its plain meaning. That was his estimation. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, as we're going to see today, Jesus just has this habit of exposing deep, deep things inside of his followers. And it, pu it puts followers of Jesus in a position where you can never truly be fully comfortable around Jesus. The moment that Jesus doesn't bother you is the moment you know you've stopped listening to him, really. And that's the kind of effect that these words had on the people who heard Jesus. I'm going to ask you to open up a Bible. We're going to look at a passage in chapter 5. But just quickly, I want us to look at the last words of, of, the last words of chapter 7 uh, and how the, these first crowds responded to Jesus. It's very telling. Very telling. So if you have a Bible, open it, turn it on, whatever you do. Uh, go to the end of Matthew chapter 7. And the last words of the chapter tell us uh, how people felt when they heard Jesus give these teachings. It's in chapter 7, verse 28. And we read, When Jesus finished saying these things, 
The crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not like their teachers of the law. Now, just a couple things are illuminating here. I'm reading from the New International Version. It's a wonderful translation. So I have amazed. People were amazed when they heard Jesus finish uh, giving this talk. Any other translations? There's going to be some. Not amazed, but what? Astounded or astonished? Yeah, uh, which is amazed. This is not a problem with the NIV. It's a problem with English. Amazed is be- becoming more and more of a weak word. You know, pizza is amazing. You know, uh, pinball is amazing. My wife's amazing. God's amazing. You know what I'm saying? What a useless word. You know, uh, they can describe all of those things. So, uh, astounded. That's, we're more in the ballpark here. Astonished. In, in the word that uh, that Matthew used in Greek to describe this is to be out of mind. Jesus blew people's minds. They didn't have a category for the kinds of things that his teaching raised inside of them. It both bothered them and impressed them. They learned and they were deeply challenged. It blew their minds. Why? Well, it was related to his authority, and his authority in relationship to Israel's law. Now, when you see the word law there, um, think Jewish history, Israelite history. Don't think law or lawyers in modern Western culture. So that word law, underneath it's a Hebrew word, Torah, which uh, can refer to the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament. Uh, In Jewish tradition, it's called the Torah. And the Torah uh, is a story, the first five books, Um, But it also, the word Torah can refer to the laws. There's a bunch of commands that God gives to Israel in these books. You are very familiar, I'm sure, with the first ten. Whether you're a Christian or not, you've heard of the Ten Commandments. You know what I mean. Uh, You guys know them? Ten Commandments? We won't do the list, but, you know, don't steal, lie, that kind of thing. So the Ten Commandments, and that's just the first ten. There's 603 more in those first five books of the Bible. It's a lot of commands. And in Jesus' day, and for hundreds of years among His people, these were the definitive statement of God to His people about how they were to live and be humans together in in the community of Israel. And then here's Jesus enters the scene, announcing that God's kingdom is here, that He's bringing it. And Jesus walks around Israel like He owns the place, you know, and just telling people that here's what the Torah says, and here's what I say. Like when Jesus gave these words, he just sat his words alongside the Torah and the commands of the Torah. And I don't know what effect that has on you, but in Jesus' day, it blew people's minds. They didn't have categories for it. So it was mind-blowing because of this issue of authority that Jesus spoke with, but also, as we're going to see, we can turn back to chapter 5. Why don't you go back there with me? Uh, We're going to start in verse uh, 17. It's not just about authority, it's about the kinds of things Jesus addressed. And let me uh, just get an image in in our minds, in our imaginations, that I think will help us have a framework for what Jesus is getting at in the section we're going to look at in in chapter 5. And it's all all about, think icebergs. It's all about icebergs. Um, I was sitting in the doctor's office. Um, a couple years ago, uh, when our church community, uh, I go to Door of Hope, um, was going through the Sermon on the Mount, and I was helping teach through the Sermon on the Mount, and I was really disturbed <laughs> as we were doing so. And I was in the doctor's office, and uh, there was a National Geographic. And you guys know National Geographic is like a staple in dentist's offices and doctor's offices, that kind of thing. So it was this really interesting photo essay about the Arctic Ocean and the creatures that live there and all that, all that kind of thing that inhabit these almost freezing waters. And uh, what struck me was the iceberg photographs, these gigantic, huge icebergs. And you guys seen these photos before. They're they're kind of, there's quite a few out there now in the interweb world. And so there there you go. They're just, they're remarkable. These uh, gigantic ice mountains floating in the Arctic Ocean. They're just, they're huge. Thousands of metric tons. And what grabbed my attention, and I think what makes us interested in these photographs that are both above and below water, is this this relationship, the strange relationship between what you can see above 
and then what in reality is below. Because if you're just in a boat, I guess you wouldn't go recreational boating in the Arctic Ocean, but whatever, if you're in an icebreaker, a big freighter or something like that, and you're going, and you're just above water, that's my point here, if you're above water, you see this thing above, what's above? It could be 10 feet out of the water, it could be 30 feet out of the water. But what you have, if you're above water only, you just have no clue, no perception of what in reality is underneath the weight and the mass of the thing that's keeping what's on the surface afloat. And there's no clear proportional relationship, like the size of the thing above means that there's this much, but like this, just no. And so look at that massive thing on the right, you know? And you would just have no clue if you're just above the water on the surface. And I think this is what fascinates us about these iceberg photographs, is this disparity, this contrast between what you can see and then what in reality is under the surface. And it, it seems to me that this captures exactly Jesus' view of human nature and, and his view of human behavior. And when Jesus exposed the things that he exposed inside of people, it, it, they were amazed. <laughs> it blew their mind. Not just because of his authority, but because of what Jesus was able to discern is really underneath people's behavior. What Jesus, I mean, just think, like on an average day, you're at work, you're in your home with your family or your roommates, uh, whatever, you're in your community, and what we observe is just behavior, right? So she's an extrovert, he's an introvert, you know? She's kind of stingy, he's really generous, he's really nice, she's kind. He's not kind, you know. We, we observe and bump off of each other all day long with our surface behaviors. And that's all we can see. And what we just have no clue about are like the deep level stories and motivations and values that are under there, right? You're, the story of your family, the story of your most formative memories and experiences as you were growing up, the experiences that you had as you come into adulthood, if you are an adult, not everybody in the room is, but so you're having these experiences right now if you're a kiddo. And so all of these, and then the way our culture shapes us and, and forms us and shapes what we love, the things that we love and the things that we value the most, the things that we fear, the things that we hate, these are the real things under the surface that drive us to do what we do that we can see on the surface. And Jesus knows this, just like any good therapist knows this about how humans work. And what Jesus is not satisfied with doing is forming yet another community of people who are just about behavior modification. Jesus is here to address the real issues and the problems with the human condition to expose them, which is why reading the Sermon on the Mount is painful, and then also to move towards a solution. And you're going to see all these dynamics at work in the passage we read today. That was all the Surgeon General's warning for the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? So chapter 5, verse 17. Here's what Jesus says. He says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law, again, Hebrew word, Torah, or the prophets. And that's a J Jewish shorthand for the scriptures, uh, which Christians call the Old Testament in their day, it's just called the Bible or the Torah and the prophets. I, I haven't come to abolish them or set them aside. Rather, I've come to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the Torah until everything's accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, unless, your, unless the quality of your relationships and the integrity with which you follow God and behave in your relationships, unless that surpasses the most religious people you could possibly imagine, there's no way you're entering the kingdom of heaven. 
So tell us what you really think, Jesus. <laughs> okay. So, so what's he saying? He's saying he's, when he walks around acting like he owns the place, and when he says, yeah, here's a command from the Torah, and here's what I say to you, when he claims that kind of authority, what he's not doing, he says, is saying, I'm here, just listen to what I say, like trash the, script, trash the Old Testament. You don't need it anymore. You can just scrap it now. He says, that's not what I'm doing. His goal isn't to come and to say, don't listen to that statement of God's will anymore. What, what is he here to do with the, all the commands of the Torah? What does he say? To fulfill them. Fulfill them. What does, it, what does that mean? I'm here to fulfill the Torah. And this isn't just about predictive prophecy. This is much, much deeper. This is woven into the story that Jesus sees himself a part of. The story he believes he's bringing to its culmination. And it's, it's, the, it's the Old Testament story. It's the story of his people. Um, and specifically, it's, it begins with the moment that God freed his people out of slavery in Egypt. You've either read the story or seen the movie, I hope. If not, go do at least one of those. So he frees his people from slavery in Egypt. He brings them to the foot of a mountain. What's the name of this mountain? It's Mount Sinai. And he invites these slaves that he's freed into a covenant relationship a formal relationship, and he begins to give them the laws of this, the, the terms of this covenant. We call them laws. They, they called them the divine words. And the, you know the first 10, right? The first 10, the famous 10 commandments, and then 603 follow in the books of the Torah. And what all of these commands are doing is they're designed to shape these Israelites as a contrast community in contrast to the neighboring cultures around them in Babylon and Egypt and they're to become a nation with a different standard of generosity and justice and care for the vulnerable in their midst. And as they do so, God says they'll become a kingdom of priests. They'll become these mediators of God's character to the nations, and they'll, they'll show what God is really ideally pulling humans towards, towards His will and becoming all that God made them to be. So that's at least the setup with all of these laws and what they're about. And then the story goes on to show how Israel does in this covenant relationship. And how do they do? They do horribly. <laughs> right? This is a fail, epic fail. 600 year long epic fail. And it all, the nation's leaders crash Israel into the ground. They end up getting conquered by all these different powers and carried away into exile. Epic fail. And this is where Israel's prophets, it's the law and the prophets that Jesus came to fulfill. And the prophets come onto the scene after Israel's failure, and they look back and they lament how terrible this whole thing has been, but then they look forward with hope. And there's many passages that we could look to in the prophets. I just want to show you one, because this is certainly one of the passages that's on Jesus' mind when he says this, what he says here, that he's here to fulfill the Torah, and the prophets. It's from uh, the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31. And here's what he has to say. He says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It won't be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Yeah, they broke that covenant. Epic fail, 600 years long. Even though I was a husband to them, constantly faithful. I stuck by them. I didn't bail on them. They bailed on me. So it's not going to be that way. Here's this new kind of covenant that I'm going to make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I'm going to put my Torah in their minds. I'm going to write the Torah on their hearts. I'm going to be their God, and they will become my people. And no longer will they need anybody to teach their neighbor and say, hey, you should know the Lord, because they'll all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, because here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to forgive their wickedness, and I'm going to remember their sins no more. So at the end of a 600-year epic fail, here's what the God of Israel could do. He could just walk away from this covenant relationship. And the prophets discern that's exactly the opposite of what the God of Israel is going to do. Instead, he's going to keep moving towards these failed people, 
these failed human beings, He's going to move towards them again. And here's what He's going to do this time. He's actually going to do something. He's going to not just inscribe the commands on stone and deliver them to, to modify their behavior. Whatever God's going to do, he's going to, he's going to fundamentally heal and transform the human condition. He's not just going to say, don't do this or do this, like the Ten Commandments do. He's going to move under the water, and He's going to address those deep issues of the heart and of the mind. And He's going to, tra- he's going to, he's going to do something. You don't know what it is. You have to keep reading, right? He's, the prophets, he's, God's going to do it. How's He going to do it? He's going to so fundamentally transform the human heart that you just by nature discern God's will and know how to be human and how to relate to others the way God wants you to. And Jesus says, yeah, this is what I'm here to do. I'm here to bring that promise into reality. Well, how? Well, you got to keep reading the Gospel of Matthew, right? But, but watch what He does here. He's going to address six areas, and we're, we're not going to look at all six in, in equal depth, but we'll look at a few. He's going to address six areas where the, a law was inscribed on the Ten Commandments. And then what he's going to do is he's going to take a deep dive beneath the surface and expose the mountain underneath, right? This massive iceberg of human brokenness and selfishness and say that's the real issue, and that's the issue that he's here to, to address. Watch how he does this. Brilliant. Is verse 21. He says, You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. You've heard that one before? It's one of the famous Ten Commandments. There you go. Don't murder. And Jesus affirms it. He's not here to abolish or set aside the Torah. He affirms it. He says, yes, anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, He now says on his own authority that anyone who's angry with his brother or sister is subject to judgment. What? Yeah, anyone who says to a brother or sister, I'm reading the New New International Version, which has chosen not to translate the next word. (laughs) Raka is what I have in my translation here. Anybody else? What's in your translations? You can say it. So can you have permission to speak, <laughs> right? Idiot. Yeah, idiot or fool. Yeah. So, um, of course, you did you say raka yesterday? No, you didn't. It's an ancient Aramaic word, and you, didn't, you don't speak Aramaic. So, it's a, it means it's empty. And whether it's empty head or empty heart, the point you're saying this person does a nothing. You're a nothing. Whoever says to another person, you're a nothing, they're answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Holy cow. Jesus turns up the volume here. So for murdering someone, you face justice. For calling someone an idiot, your eternal destiny is at stake. Jesus, meek and mild, right? (laughs) Not. So let's say, you know, you're in worship and you're offering your gift at the altar. And there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, there's some relational conflict, and you're there to worship God, and you think everything's fine between you and God, and then you remember like, oh no, I like wronged that person, and oh, I haven't made it right yet. And then Jesus says, well, then you're not right with God if you're not right with another human. So stop your worship right there in front of the altar. First go be reconciled to them, then come and give your honor and worship to God. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it, he tells this little parable, do it while you're still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge will hand you over to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison, and I tell you, you won't get out till you've paid the last penny. How you guys doing? (laughs) Yeah, and you're like, oh, I thought I was doing pretty good. I've never killed anybody. (laughs) And Jesus is like, what, what a joke. You've never, congratulations, you've never murdered anybody, right? You're a good human because of this. What, are, are you kidding me? Would you, for, for Jesus, what, what, he's comparing what's above and what's beneath the surface. So when someone murders another, they, they have a view of themselves as having some kind of right or authority or elevated status over 
the existence or life of another human that they can erase it or snuff them out. But then Jesus says, you know, think about what happens when, when you call someone a nothing. When you, in Jesus' mind, this is about, it's about pride and it's about contempt. It's about the self-elevation of myself and my honor and my dignity, and I am worthy of such honor and dignity that this person who's different from me than's other than me is clearly not. And when I've elevated myself, I can justify all kinds of words that I can say about this person. And in Jesus' mind, there's absolutely nothing different between murder and slander, between murder and making fun of somebody that you don't like because you think you're better than them. In Jesus' mind, it's the same ideal of what God intends for human beings that's broken. And so he says that's the real issue. It's about self-elevation and pride and contempt. That's what my disciples are going to work on addressing and exposing. How you guys doing? <laughs> Here's another one. Let's talk about sex, even though I know it's Family Sunday. John invited me here. I don't know. Verse 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. I've never committed adultery. Congratulations. You are a wonderful human being. Jesus addresses the men in the crowd. He says, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. The, the stakes are so high here. If your right eye causes you to stumble, get rid of that thing. Throw it away. It'd be better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It'd be better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to that eternal destiny. So, okay, so, so I've never violated someone else's marriage covenant, sexual unfaithfulness. Congratulations, Jesus says. That, that doesn't mean that you are a human living according to God's will. All that law does is it points to a deeper issue that God is trying to expose there. And it's the same issue as in murder and anger and contempt. When, when I view myself, my appetite for phys physical pleasure, wh whatever it is, when I view me and my desires as more important than the well-being and the dignity of another human being, then all of a sudden that justifies all kinds of behavior and that manifests itself in, in sexual misbehavior and it manifests itself in the movies that we play about other human beings in our minds to entertain our fantasies. And in Jesus' mind, there's no difference. I'm, I'm dehumanizing another person and making them an object for, for my own pleasure. It's the same exact thing. You get into bed with them, you don't get into bed with them. Jesus doesn't care. He's here to expose what's underneath the surface. How you guys doing? So he goes on. He goes on. He, he talks about divorce. It's actually really, really complicated. In Jesus' day, only in Jewish culture of Jesus' day, only men could initiate divorces, and they could do so for any reason by the majority opinion. Let me just stop and repeat that. In Jesus' day, only men could initiate divorces, and they could do it for any reason, according to a majority opinion of the rabbis. This is a recipe for abuse, an extreme oppression of women. Is this a recipe? Absolutely. And so what Jesus, he, he takes what in our day looks like the conservative line. In his day, it was a radical position staked out to elevate the dignity of Jewish women which is to say Jewish men can't simply treat women according to their own desires and, and cut them off from a marriage covenant for whatever reason that they want. That's not what it means to live as a true human being. It's the, but it's the same issue underneath. He talks about oaths. He talks about uh, swearing by the God of Israel, swearing by your grandmother's grave. <laughs> like he doesn't care. So, so we, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow from someone else's integrity to prop up the holes in my character when I make a promise to you. I promise I'll be there. I swear on my grandmother's grave. And Jesus is like, what are you doing? What are you, so ridiculous, right? Are you with me? Jesus, he just doesn't pull any punches. 
He talks about revenge. Look at the last one. This last one's very powerful, verse 43. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor. Now, that's not one of the Ten Commandments, but it is one of the commands in the Torah. It's from your favorite book of the Bible, Leviticus. It's worth quoting from. <laughs> Leviticus 19, verse 18. He said, so you, you've heard. It says in the Torah, love your neighbor. And then he says this, you've also heard, hate your enemy. So here he's quoting a, a, a debate going on in his day among Jewish teachers about, well, who constitutes your neighbor? And the majority op opinion was essentially, your neighbor is other Israelites of equal social status as you. So you love your neighbor, but there's a whole bunch of people out there that God's not asking you to love. That would just be too much. <laughs> and Jesus just says, what? Such a joke. He says, I tell you, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you can become children of your Father who's in heaven. Listen, he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. Does God discriminate good people from bad people by the rainfall or sunrise? Just look at the weather patterns and you'll learn something about God's character. If you love those, only those who love you, what reward will you? Congratulations. <laughs> Aren't the tax collectors doing that? A and if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than anyone else? Don't the Romans and the Greeks do that? No, no. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father's perfect. And that's the end of the chapter. <laughs> Jeez. Save us. <laughs> what on earth? So, so in Jesus' mind, this is, notice that this is all about relationships. In Jesus' mind, following him means having the darkest, deepest flaws in our character exposed when it comes to the health of our everyday relationships. In Jesus' mind, to truly know and follow him means going to that level and addressing issues of that, of that depth, which is very uncomfortable for most of us. And Jesus says, you, actually, you can tell the litmus test for what kind of human I am is how I treat people I don't like and who don't like me. Like, if you want to know what kind of person you are, Jesus says, don't look at how you treat your friends. <laughs> Isn't this interesting? It's really disturbing. Don't look at how you treat your friends because your friends will help you and you help them and you're nice to them and they're nice to you. If you really want to know what kind of human you are, look at the people that you don't like. Look at the people that you gain no benefit from. Look at the people who actually have a negative effect on you and how you respond to those people, Jesus says, will tell you who you really are under the surface. And then he says, so be perfect. <laughs> so, okay, this is only chapter five, you guys. This is a 28 chapter book, right? So you have to keep reading, but he's exposed what's underneath. He's exposed what it, what it means. He's not here to set the Torah aside. Rather, the laws of the Torah were calling Israel, and now he's calling his disciples to be new and different kinds of human beings who have a fundamental change in how I view myself, in how I view God, and how I view other people with this powerful metaphor of the writing of the commands of the Torah on the heart. So here's what I, I could talk for m way much longer <laughs> um, to land the plane, uh, but instead I'd rather show you a Bible project video that we made about this very topic that will land the plane uh, f for me and do it in a more succinct way. Uh, but, I, but just ask yourself, is anybody in the room feeling uncomfortable <laughs> about what Jesus is exposing? And what, why, did, why did Jesus force the issue? Why did he go through it six times to make sure every one of us starts squirming at some point as you read the Sermon on the Mount? There's a reason why. It's because of what he came to do. And so with that, uh, I think the video will kind of tie the pieces together and then we'll conclude and move towards worship. Sound good? Yeah. Cool. You're most likely familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Bible, stuff we generally take as good advice. Don't murder, don't steal honor your parents, the list goes on. And those are just the first 10. There are actually a total of 613 commands, all given to ancient Israel, found in the first five books of the Bible, which in Hebrew are called the Torah. Now the word Torah is usually translated in English as the law, because it has all of these laws in it. And as you read through them, you wonder, 
Am I supposed to obey some of these? All of these? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? Well, that translation is kind of confusing because while the Torah has laws in it, the book itself is fundamentally a story about how God is creating new kinds of people who are fully able to love God and love others. And when Jesus taught about the Torah, he said that he was bringing that story to its fulfillment. So walk me through the story and how it's fulfilled. So the story begins with God creating humanity who rebels. And God chooses Abraham to bless all of the nations through his family, who end up in slavery down in Egypt, and so God rescues them. Then at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with Israel, like an agreement. And all of the laws that Moses gives to Israel are the terms of that agreement. They're like a constitution. And so some of the laws, they're about rituals and customs that set Israel apart from the nations. Other laws are about social justice or morality. And by following these, Israel would show the other nations what God is like. Okay, so the rest of the Torah is just the complete list of laws that Moses gives Israel? Mm, no, the rest of the Torah just continues the story. And the 613 commands are only a selection from that original constitution. And even these have been broken up and placed at strategic points within the story. Now pay attention because you'll see a really clear pattern. Moses gives the first laws to Israel. If don't worship other gods, don't make idols. And then right after that, there's a story of Israel breaking those very laws. Yeah, they worship the golden calf. And so Moses gives some more laws. And then you get more stories of rebellion. Some more laws, rebellion again, some more laws, more rebellion, and you start to see the point. Right, no matter how many laws, they're just going to continue to rebel. So at the conclusion of the Torah's story, Moses gives this final speech to Israel as they prepare to go into their new home. And he tells them, you guys, I know that you're not going to follow all of God's laws. You've proven to me that you're incapable. And Moses says the problem is that their hearts are hard and that they're going to need new transformed hearts if they're ever going to truly follow God's law. And he was right. I mean, the story goes on to recount Israel's total failure. They go into the land, they break all the laws. Right. Now, the next section of books in the Jewish tradition are the 15 books of the prophets, and they reflect back on the story. For example, Ezekiel, he said that if Israel was ever going to obey the law, God's spirit would have to transform their hard hearts into soft hearts. And Jeremiah said that's when obedience to God's commands wouldn't feel like a duty, but they would be written deep in their hearts. And Isaiah, he promised a future leader, Israel's Messiah, who will lead all of the people in obedience to the law. Now, in Jewish tradition, all of these books together are called the prophets, even the historical books, because they're continuing the story told from the perspective of the prophets. Okay, so we have the law and the prophets, and they're telling one connected story about God's desire to bless the whole world through a people, Israel, who it turns out needs a new heart. Yes, and Jesus saw himself as continuing that story. So he agreed with the law and the prophets when he taught that it's out of the human heart that come the most ugly parts of human nature. It's like the default setting of our hearts is opposed to God's law. But Jesus also said that he came to solve that problem, and in his words, to fulfill the law. So what does he mean there, to fulfill the law? Well, first he said that the demand of all of the laws in the Torah could be fulfilled by what he called the great command, that we are to love God and to love others. So that seems pretty easy. I mean, we all want to love. Well, we think we want to love. But Jesus showed how love is far more demanding than we realize. So he quotes the law, do not murder. And he says, yes, not killing someone is a very loving thing to do. But then he also says that when you treat someone with disrespect or when you nurse resentment against them, you're also violating God's moral ideal because you're not treating that person with love. And so Jesus said true love ought to extend even to our own enemies. So even though this command seems very simple, Jesus showed how our hearts are not currently equipped to fulfill even this basic command of God to love others. And that's kind of a downer. But where Israel failed, Jesus brought this story to its fulfillment. As Israel's Messiah, he fully loved God and others. And he showed all of the nations what God is truly like. He did this through his acts of compassion and mercy and ultimately by loving his enemies even unto death. And after his resurrection, he told his followers that he would send God's spirit to transform their hearts so that they could follow him and fulfill the purpose of the law, to love God and to love their neighbor. So this fulfills the story of the law and the prophets, or in the words of the Apostle Paul, the one who loves fulfills the law.
<laughs> so, Jesus, man. Um, the prophet Jeremiah said that the Torah would be written on the hearts of God's people when this great act of forgiveness would happen, when I forgive their sins. After 600 years of failure, God hasn't given up on them. He will forgive them. And Jesus came to, to embody and to become God's forgiving love in and as a human. He, he is God's forgiving love, become human. Jesus is the fulfillment of what this whole story has been pointing towards, that you and I have perpetually failed to be the humans that God has made us to be. And Jesus comes as, that, as the kind of human that we're made to be and that we fail to be, and He actually, He is the Torah embodied in a human being. He is love as a human being. And how did Jesus treat His enemies and the people that didn't like Him? He gave His life for them much less the people that he liked, <laughs> the people that he didn't like. And he goes to his death, in his own words, as an act of love, to take into himself all of the consequences of the evil and the pain and the screwed up ways of being human that we have all introduced and we trashed God's good world and we trashed each other and he takes it into himself and he conquers it with his life and with his love. This is good news, amen? And what he invites us to do as his followers is to be in this space called a church community, right? And to be, for this to be a place where we can be open about what's underneath the surface, and we can allow Jesus' great act of love and forgiveness to do its slow, deep work on us, week after week and day after day, as you try and learn how to follow Jesus together as a community. It's the, it's the only way. It's good news. It's that Jesus' love meets us precisely in our moment of greatest failure. And so, this perfect way to transition to um, what we're going to do right now, which is eat the story of Jesus' forgiving love for us as we take the bread and the cup together, as we experience once again this this embodiment of Jesus' forgiveness for us in His life and death and His resurrection. And here's what I would challenge you to do, and then I'll just, I'll pray, is to just get one person, one relationship in your life that's been, that's been fractured, one relationship where there's some way that you've elevated yourself, that you've wronged another person. And it's like what Jesus said, like you're here to worship, but actually you've got this thing hanging out there, right? This, this broken thing that's not right with somebody. Who is that person for you? And what's the, what's the deep issues underneath why you treat that person the way that you do? And Jesus would say, before you do anything else, before you do anything else, purpose to do something about that. This is what it means to follow Jesus, and it means that we're never comfortable, that we're always growing into His love and grace. Amen? Amen. Let me close in a word of prayer. Jesus, you are beautiful. Uh, your words are compelling, and even more, your, your life, your love, your death is compelling. Thank you for meeting us uh, precisely in our failures. We confess them. We bring them to you. Uh, would you please write your love on our hearts? Uh, make us into the new and different kinds of people that we know you're calling us to be. Uh, thank you for never giving up on us. Thank you for this symbol, this concrete symbol that we can eat of your shed blood and of your broken body that was offered in love for us. Jesus, thank you, we pray in your name. Amen.